the last two years, we've seen some dramatic examples of bark beetle outbreaks um, that associated with massive tree mortality. Um, and here's one example of one such event. Uh, this is a photo from our co-author. And the hillside in the background there in central Colorado probably has more dead pines on it than it has living pines. And there's a variety of causes in tree death, but, but much of this mortality has been associated with bark beetle outbreaks. Now, pines have one primary defense against bark beetles, and that is the production of resin, oleoresins. And here we have a, a poor dendroctinous beetle that's been stuck in the resin in the pitch tube, which is the induced uh, response by the pine. Uh, so resin production, or variation in resin production, has been implicated as one of the main sources, or the main source of differential susceptibility to mortality or to succumbing to a bark beetle attack. However, resin production is difficult to measure. Um, it's time consuming to measure. It can be done. Uh, folks do it. And also, it's a snapshot in time. You can measure production capturing resin after a wound at one point in time. But it turns out that several studies now have shown that the resin canals, the resin ducts, provide this, this the, the pipeways through which resin is moved, intercellular space through which resin moves to the wound. Those are predictive of. Uh, attack success or failure, or tree survival or tree mortality. So here's an example. There's been several studies that have shown this. Here's one by our co-author, Scott Ferenberg. And in this work with Jeff Kane, they examined a population, or two, two populations of uh, pines. We'll talk about Pinus flexilis here, where there's a significant result. In this Pinus flexilis population in Colorado, all of the trees they examined had been attacked by bark beetle, but the trees which had survived attack had higher resin duct densities, axial resin ducts in the secondary xylem, than did the trees which uh, succumbed to attack. Right? So there's this potential for this trait, resin duct density, to be predictive of uh, attack survival. And there's also, uh, uh, researchers have found re other resin duct traits, such as res total resin area, resin duct area, resin duct uh, diameter could be predictive as well. So here we're looking at resin duct density. So how does resin duct density vary and why? Well, we expect, of course, different species, different ecological strategies might have different absolute numbers of resin ducts. Um, this could be due to ecology or, um, and or some combination of ecology and, and uh, genetic history, and history. So we expect that sort of effect. And there's been some population differences which have been uh, found. And, uh, there's also within population differences, such as I've shown you, trees growing side by side. That's presumed to be genetic differences in those trees, though that hasn't been tested, obviously. It's kind of, some of this is difficult in long-lived species. There are also certainly environmental plastic effects. Uh, Sharon Hood and authors have shown responses to fire. There's an, there's are patterns with resin duct uh, density with past climate as well. And that makes sense that there should be some interaction with growth, There'd be, as defense theory might say. And there's also a potential uh, effect of cambial age. So trees might change resin duct investment as they age. Um, and this could actually be a confounding effect in some past work in which uh, the resin duct density is taken from rings of unknown age. Um, and, this, and certainly cambial age is known to be important in resin production work in plantations where resin is collected. They know the tree age influences production. So Eric set out to uh, conduct a broad exploratory study looking at how resin duct density varies across five species of pines in West Texas, across topographical elevation gradients in these arid mountain ranges, with tree age, and looking explicitly at um, some measures of past climate and past annual climate. This work was conducted in three mountain ranges in Texas. We've got the uh, Guadalupe's, the Davis, and the Chisos Mountains. These are Sky Island mountain ranges surrounded by Chihuahuan Desert and Chihuahuan Desert grasslands, and then they support pine and oak forest at the highest elevations. Here's what some of these systems look like. Um, here is actually the grand champion Ponderosa pine for Texas. All right, and those are some Chihuahua Lab students for scale. Um, and what this shows you, if you've seen Ponderosa pine in wetter parts of North America, that not everything is bigger in Texas. <laughs> that's that's big. That's a big tree for Texas, for West Texas, anyway. All right. So, 
We have five species that we looked at. Let me break these up into their subsections. So we have what we're calling for now Pinus arizonica variety stormier. I won't get into the systematics of that interesting population in the Chisos Mountains, true Pinus ponderosa in the Davis and the Guadalupes. These are both in the ponderosa subsection. We have two pinion pines in the Symploides subsection. And then we have, just in the Davis and the Guadalupes, we've got southwestern white pine, Pinus droliformis. And the results I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you by subsection, because we both expected and we found that actually resin duct patterns were essentially indistinguishable among species within a subsection. So I'm not looking at a species level, but one level higher for these three plates. All right, so there's Eric coring trees. Uh, he recorded diameter breast height, GPS the tree location, and measured ring dimensions and counted resin ducts. Here's what those cores look like, wide 12 millimeter cores. Um, we then get ring width, total measure of ring area of that core, and then he can count these ducts that are indicated, very difficult to see here, but these intercellular ducts indicated by the yellow arrows, and we can look at total duct count and also um, duct density by dividing by the area, the cross-sectional area of that uh, ring in that core. Right, and each one of these can be associated to a tree age in a calendar year. All right, so we investigated how resin duct density varies and also how growth varies, how ring width varies. We're interested in this as well as a covariate. Uh, according to subsection and mountain range, mountain range turned out to not be important. Um, stand basal area of the trees surrounding that target tree as a measure of competition, the elevation, and some other uh, DM derived variables that again turned out not to be important. We have on each ring its age, and also the detrended ring width. This is ring, the residuals of ring width once, we, once we've accounted for tree age. Right? So that's our measure of growth. And then we have a climate time series, which is a, uh, we use the running average of the annual uh, modified Palmer drop severity index. And then of course, this is nested data. We've got tree rings are nested in individual trees. We expect strong individual tree effects. And we have to deal with calendar year because our time series is not tree specific. All right, so let's look at some of the results of uh, uh, growth. This is our modified Palmer Drop Severity Index. Every circle here in this graph is actually a calendar year. For, so um, a calendar year for each subsection. And the y-axis is detrended ring width. And lo and behold, we can detect a weak but significant climate signal in the growth data, at least across this whole mountain range. And this is, I, we did the linear models with the full interactions. I'm just showing you some bivariate plots of the strongest effects, right? And so we see in wetter years on the right-hand side, we see ring widths, which are greater than you'd expect for the age of the tree and the opposite in dry years. Not surprising. We see an interaction um, effect and a, and a weak main effect of stand basal area driven mostly by the ponderosa pines skin growth. And so we're picking up some competition effect it looks like in the Ponderosa, where trees that are in stands of higher density have lower than expected ring widths. Okay, well let's get on to the resin duct density. All right, we're picking up some growth patterns, that's good. There's a striking difference in average resin duct density across these subsections. Subsections differ, with the pinion pines and sembroides having much higher uh, resin duct densities okay, for whatever reason. However, more interestingly, there's a consistent effect of age across these subsections. And here I've broken the data up into just, it surely should be less than or equal to 15 years and greater than 15 years cambial age. Those three subsections, we find that as trees age, resin duct density declines. So there's reduced investment, at least in resin ducts, not resin production, uh, with age um, that's consistent across these trees. That's a quite strong effect. <laughs> There's another striking effect, and that's its association with growth. On the x-axis here is detrended ring width. These are, um, so greater than zero numbers are ring widths which are wider than would be expected for the tree's age. Negative numbers are ring widths which are narrower than, than would be expected for the tree's age. And we find that in poor years or poor sites where ring widths are narrow, we have high resin duct investment or high resin duct density. And then in the good years or in good sites, we have low resin duct density. It's driven mostly by the young cambial ages, however, and it's muted in older terms. It continues to go down through time. 
that the, the slopes of those. So we have this driven by the younger Cambrian ages, this effect of width of uh, growth. So obviously, ring, there's a relationship between duct density and area that's inherited in the calculation of duct density. But this does mean that as trees have wider rings, resin duct count isn't keeping up proportionally, and therefore density is declining. Then finally, the only other really strong effect in these, well, significant effect in these models, but it's of much lower magnitude, is an elevation effect. And here, if I just show you a bivariate plot, I'm not showing you the residuals, in it, it's actually it's almost indetectable, right? So it's, it's essentially flat for everything but the ponderosae pines. I'm showing this because it's a significant effect in the models, and it's something that's been reported in the literature of decreasing resin duct density with elevation. And here we're seeing maybe a small signal driven by the ponderosa pines, but it's certainly of lower magnitude than the age and the growth rate effects. OK, so that's the broad overview of this pattern. So in summary, resin duct density is highest in the pinion pines, lower in the ponderosa subsection and stroboformis, although what it means to compare that with different, very different you know, ecological strategies and microhabitats, that's sort of expected that you'd have differences. I don't know how to interpret those quite yet. But within a tree, resin duct density declines with cambial age. That's a pretty strong effect. And another strong effect is that resin duct density is lower during years with high annual growth. But this effect is most pronounced at young cambial ages. So what does it all mean? Well, we're still working some of this out and have a bit more to do with this, but I'll give you one take home for now that I think is probably going to be one of the more important points of this, and that is that several past studies report elevation effects or just population differences, but it's not always been possible. It's not because they feel them plan to, it's just it's, for some trees it's very difficult to age rings. You've got rotten cores and you can't go to the center of the tree like we were able to with these relatively small pines. And in those cases, age differences among the stands or different demographic histories of those stands might be uh, driving some of the reported resin duct density patterns, and these may not be uh, you know, genetic population differences. So with that, I may have a minute for questions, I think. <laughs> Well, cell number is often increasing. There's cell size differences with different rings. There's also some cell number differences. We haven't, we haven't measured those in these. And in fact, we haven't done some of the other anatomy on resin. We've got counts on them right now. Um, so I can't tell you exactly what's going on, but we expect some of that. Um, one other, some studies have looked at resin duct area as being more predictive, and that kind of makes sense. It's a pipe, you know, it's a pipe flow problem. It's just that we have the most consistent predictor of susceptibility within, popula within population studies has been resin duct density. So we, we looked at that for now because empirically it's been shown to be a predictor, if that makes sense. But I don't have all the anatomy on these. Yeah. One question. Given resin ducts are more common than lake woods and early Yes. That's a really good point, because I'm not sure what that is. It means that we consistently, across pines, you see resin duct density in late early wood and throughout the late wood. Um, so most common, most common in, the, in the late wood. And so maybe there's some constraint that that's where it has to be and so that you should account for it. We haven't done that yet, but that's a really good point. I've, I've been wondering if we should, we should maybe try to do that. So and, yeah, it would be good to know. I think, OK, I thought my time's up. I need to introduce the next speaker. <laughs> <laughs>